Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Erwin martinez Falier, your professor in Pharmacy Department, San Pedro College, and also the visiting professor in Bournemouth University, United Kingdom. And welcome to our next topic on extemporaneously compounded drug, which is actually part and parcel then of topic number one on prescription analysis, part three. So for today, we're going to identify different types of compounded medications and we'll be able to define in terms of our extemporaneously compounded drugs and, of course, in terms of the dispensing uh, and, of course, uh, compounding guidelines that we need to look into uh, for this extemporaneously compounded medications. Now, we have a prescription here, uh, and then it identifies the different parts of the prescription. We have a very important one. We have the patient information. Of course, the prescriber's information. We have also the date prescription was written. We have also superscription, the Rx, which means take thou or recipe. We have also inscription, that is the medication being prescribed. The subscription, which is we're going to have uh, this particular instruction to the pharmacist, then specially compounded medication. We have also signa, which is the direction for patient, special instruction that needs to have a refill, uh, and of course, the different patient uh, prescribers' information. So at the, at the particular um, right side, we have a particular example of a prescription, which is Loprezole, which is a beta blocker. Uh, and it states here 15 milligram. We have also added up with another inscription, which is lactose quantity sufficient. Um, 300 milligram, and this are, can be prepared 24 such capsule, one capsule twice a day, and signed by Dr. Deborah Lawson. Okay, so this particular prescription, as we all know, have different parts of the prescription, and it actually identified to us that we need to have, we need to prepare 24 capsules as part of the instruction to a pharmacist and then an instruction or signal to a patient that needs to be taken one capsule twice a day. Okay, so that is the prescription by a medical doctor. Now, moving on to compounding, what is then the definition then of compounding according to United States Pharmacopeia, USP 795? So according to USP, it states that this is the preparation, mixing, assembling, altering, packaging, and labeling of a drug, drug delivery device, or a device in accordance with a licensed practitioner's prescription, medication order, or initi initiative based on the practitioner-patient-pharmacist compounder relationship in the course of a uh, professional practice. So this is based on United States Pharmacopeia in definition of uh, compounding. Now, compounding actually includes, according to United States Pharmacopeia 795, that this is a preparation of a do drug dosage form for both human and animal patient, the preparation of a drug or a device in the antip anticipation of prescription drug orders on the basis of a routine, regularly observed prescribing patterns. The reconstitution that we usually do in terms of our suspension then, or, or our sus uh, powder for suspension, or manipulation of a commercial product that may require an addition of one or more ingredients the preparation of a drug or a device for the purpose of or as an incident to the research, clinical or academic, teaching or chemical analysis, and the preparation of a drugs and devices for the prescriber's office use were permitted by the law. So this particular uh, definition by United States Pharmacopeia really identifies then what are the things that to be done in terms of compounding and what need to be observed then based on the law. Okay? And these are being defined then uh, based on the Pharmacy Board of Australia that extemporaneously compounded medication is a preparation of a therapeutic product 
for an individual patient in response to an identified need. So if there is really a need then, based on what is lacking then in a the commercial market, it is being compounded then by a compounder or a pharmacist then, specially intended for an individual patient then. No? So whether, uh, whether uh, there is a lacking of uh, a particular commercial availability in the market for a certain uh, drug or a prescription then. And when we say compounding according to RA10918, it actually referred to us as a sum of a process performed by a pharmacist in drug preparation, including the calculation, mixing, assembling, packaging, or labeling of a particular drug. And one of it is as a result of the prescription or a drug order by a physician, dentist, or a veterinarian, which usually legally in the Philippines, we have three main uh, professionals that can only prescribe uh, a certain drug order then, like the physician, dentist, or a uh, veterinarian. And then it is a purpose then or in relation to a certain research, whether it is an academic uh, research then, or uh, teaching or a chemical analysis. This is based on RA10918. Now, in extemporaneous compounding is, according to some literatures, mentioned that it is a timely preparation of a drug product according to the physician's prescription in which the amount of the ingredients are calculated then because we modify then or reconstitute then based on the original in the market and we'll be able to meet the needs of a particular patient or a group of patients according to the good manufacturing practice. So there are really similarities then of, um, of the definition from the United States Pharmacopeia, Remington, and other literature then pertaining to extemporaneous compounding and compounding of medications. Really, as we all know, it has been prescribed. That would be number one. Number two is that it has a particular need. No? So a need that which are not really available in the market that we need to modify with. At the same time also, uh, there are particular ingredients that need to be added up. We need, we need to calculate based on the quantity uh, sufficient of a particular ingredients then. And of course, number three is that it should be in incongruence then to the law, to the good manufacturing practices or to the good uh, good laboratory practices then uh, that we need to, you know, we need to modify then or we need to really prepare for a certain need of a particular patient. Now, in the compounding, this would be a difference between the definition of extemporaneous compounding and, of course, manufacturing. So, really, extemporaneous compounding is with the need of a particular individual patient. There's a prescription that needs to be complied by a pharmacist, an instruction to a pharmacist to compound certain medications then. But if you look into the manufacturing, this is a production or a process then that you need to have a large amount of a drug, a quantity which are larger than the extemporaneously compounded medication on a various mechanism wherein they can be, uh, can be compounded, manufactured in a large scale, in a large quantity then for a particular group of people or, or, or certain group of individuals then. Like for example, for hypertensive patients, no, for diabetic patients in a very large amount of population then no? that can be sold then in the market or the sold in the drug stores. Okay, so why do we need com to compound? That is uh, some patient like vulnerable groups such as pediatric patients that are requiring diluted adult strength of a particular, so there's no really available for pediatric patient. These are coming from adult patient that needs to be modified then or reconstituted, modified then or altered then to make it actually diluted from an adult strength to a pediatric patient. Now, patient needing an oral solution, especially have difficulty in terms of swallowing, 
uh, and there's no commercially available for that, that drug, a particular tablet or a particular capsule then, that needs to be modified so that it will become available for a particular patient into another form or another dosage form. And patient with sensitivity to dyes, preservative then, or flavoring that needs to be, uh, you know, needs to be actually modified then uh, that are found in a commercial formulation that can be modified into uh, a certain formulation that there's no dye, there's no preservative or any flavoring then. Or a particular dermatological formulation with a fortified or a strength or a diluted concentration of a commercially available product then. So sometimes in the dermatological uh, formulations that need to be modified then, especially in derma clinics, uh, they really modified it into a, a soap in a particular cream, ointment then no, on a certain preparation, which are not available commercially. So we have also specialized dosage for therapeutic drug monitoring and the care for a certain uh, particular group in the hospital, uh, particularly in pain management. No, and some of them are really why we need to compound is for our animal patients. Okay. So this is the workflow then according to one of the literature uh, that was uh, found in the ministry uh, in Malaysia. So I tried to adapt this one for able to us academically uh, in terms of handling of the prescription with extemporaneously preparation medicine in a particular uh, pharmacy. I looked at this is actually very here in the Philippines that once we receive the prescription then uh, whether we need to check if it is available or not for a particular medicine in a pharmacy. If it is yes, then we'll be able to dispense. If it is no, then we'll be able to discuss with our, uh, our practitioner or our prescriber then for any or modification of a certain medication. If it is yes, we'll be able to dispense when we see a, a particular commercially available in a market. If it's not commercially available, then we'll be able to check commercially available to our pharmacy then of the status of our certain or other retail drugstore which are available in the market. If it is yes, then we'll be able to obtain and dispense within 24 hours of time after checking. And if it is no, then we'll be able to search for evidence base. If what to be certain availability then, if we're going to modify, or if there's any literature that would say that we can actually extemporaneously compound certain medications. Now, if it is yes, then we'll be able to prepare and dispense an extemporaneously compounded medication. But if no, then we'll be able to instruct the patient on how to prepare prior to a certain administration or if needed to be able to prepare it immediately each time. So depending on the refill, depending on the particular dosage form, depending on the availability of our raw materials then, and of course, in terms of the time span that needed by or the frequency that needed by a certain patient. Now, we be, uh, if that to be uh, then, we be able to dispense a tablet or a capsule or any uh, a particular extemporaneously, extemporaneously compounded medication and counsel the patient accordingly. So this is very adaptable here in the Philippines then, particularly on extemporaneously compounded medication. Some of the, uh, some of the drugs are here in the Philippines though haven't actually gone into the process of compounding. Maybe uh, the sense of compounding for um, for in the Philippines in terms of compounding in the community pharmacy or in the hospital pharmacy then is actually on a certain suspension for reconstitution. Some of the hospitals, they really uh, transform or modify a particular dosage form like a tablet to a particular suspension or a particular solution then, especially for a geriatric patient have difficulty in terms of swallowing or a pediatric patient, which need to be calculated then based on the body weight. And there's a lot of considerations then when we compound certain medications. Now, there are certain common problems with special prescriptions, especially for extemporaneously compounded medication. No? Number one would be if short dated, will patient use a quantity prescribed within that particular time, especially with a short time? 
uh, especially also with the cost if using special company. So can the patient actually go on with additional charges then if that to be compounded medication? Uh, especially in terms of the frequency then if it is in the longer period of time to be used or in a shorter period of time to be used because it also matters on the stability of the certain medication especially if it is open then we need to have 14 days no? at the same time also if uh, that particular drug is a longer period of time would it exceed that then into a 30 days uh, in terms of stability of a certain medication and of course, the storage of a certain medication. Another one, number three, is a lack of detail on the prescription, especially on the creams and the ointments where no base is actually indicated in a certain prescription. And uh, for computer-generated prescription where unlicensed preparation are not in a standard venue of a certain community or in the hospital setting. And of course, there may be difficulties then in finding the formula, what is really the standardized form, except the country or the hospital or the clinic have standardized, which are approved by the Food and Drug Administration then. And there are differences between country to country in terms of compendial formula, and some of them will be having non-compendial formula, which are not uh, in the standardized form of a particular country then. And of course, there are prescription analysis in compounding consideration for a certain patient then. Number one, we will always consider the use of commercially available product. When we see the prescription then, we will be, uh, we'll be able to notify then the prescriber that there is really an available medication or a dosage form for a certain, uh, for a certain patient then. So we don't need really to move forward into a compounding process but then if it is then available for a commercially available medications so it really wastes your time if you be able to compound it and it's, it's already there it's already available no? and if no suitable commercial product exists consider a therapeutic alternative there's a lot of therapeutic alternative in the market that we can actually substitute then with the permission of the doctor and if there's available suitable dosage form, then we'll be able to have alternative. And this must be discussed then with our prescriber. An extemporaneous preparation should be done based on evidence-based references. So sometimes it's hard to find formulas that are evidence-based, okay? So you'll be able to look at particular literatures according to United States Pharmacopeia, National Formulary, and even um, other references which need uh, to have need to be an evidence base. Then always check for a suitability of the product, the brand for extemporaneous preparation. If it is suitable, then maybe there are incompatibilities. Maybe there are certain um, you know um, drug uh, drug interactions along the way. Uh, so we need really to look into if it is suitable to be added up to another uh, particular uh, excipients. And prepare, preparation should be done according to what is stated as far as possible, unless stated otherwise in a product or a leaflet. And when no information is available, compound an oral medication by dispensing a tablet or a capsule and directing the caregiver to mix just prior to administration. And number seven, stability for self -stor shelf storage in a pharmacy as applicable without opening. Once open, the stability of the preparation should be no longer than 30 days and the maximum quantity of the extemporaneously compounded preparations to be dispensed should not exceed one month. So that's really uh, a guidelines then. When look at the prescription, we'll be able to actually counsel the patient that once it is open then, it should not be more than 30 days and it should reflect into our labeling. Okay, and we'll be able to counsel the patient then regarding the, the prescription, okay, regarding the compounded medication. It should not exceed within one month, okay? And refrain from uh, assumptions on the therapeutic equivalence in the case of suggesting an alternative agent as a possibilities and supporting data may be uh, limited.
Okay, and the techniques in compounding preparations and manipulation should always be in line with the standard of a good preparation practice, good manufacturing practices, good laboratory practices, as delivering an accurate dose is a paramount for it. Okay, I think these are obvious in the preparation. We need really to not only evidence based, but also following the standardized good preparation practice or good laboratory and good manufacturing practices no? and the good pharmacy practices. The staff and the facilities are challenged to undertake such a competency assessment no? uh, in order to achieve a standard requirement. So really need to have a practice uh, in the preparation of a certain medication and always document now, all the preparations based on uh, the form that is needed, the material used, the process involved, and the, the responsible personnel in charge. You know. At the same time, also, when we try to consider for preparing extemporaneous compounded medication, you need to have this kind of a guidelines. Okay? One would be uh, the pharmacy personnel are reminded not to empirically change the flavoring or suspending agent because it may affect in terms of the pH and the stability of the product and the result would be unstable product then, okay? I think these are obvious, no? So there may be incompatibilities or caking, precipitation, cracking, and other, uh, the other uh, forms of incompatibilities may happen. And number two is that we able to ingredients in the formulation that require special precautions, especially with the neonates. Maybe it will cause a lot of um, incompatibility, especially in the organs of a neonate, which are not fully developed, as what we discussed in part number two. And number three is that mixing of a compounded formulation should always be in line with the following principle. These are the principles that need to be considered. Okay, number one would be uh, ensure that all ingredient use are within the expiry date. Okay, don't use those uh, compounded uh, products no? which have an ingredient that near nearby expiry. Okay, and ensure that all the our uh, particular utensils, all our particular, um, you know, um, this particular equipments that we use should be clean, including the mortar and pestle, the graduated cylinders, the pill cutters, and steering rods. And the product should be labeled clearly then, identifying all the criteria that we have mentioned a while ago. And it should be stored as recommended within the formula. Okay, and as we all know, it should not be with more than one month. Okay, and for solution or suspension product, we should emphasize the importance of a thorough shaking, the counseling, Okay, shaking before administration of a particular drug. Now, if compounding a preparation using contents from an ampule, please take note that these are made of glass. We always be remember that we'll be able to withdraw the solution or a certain medication then in an ampule using a filter needle so that there will be no glass particles that are incorporated in a particular uh, compound or ingredients. And of course, Number five, we'll be able to place a tablets with a mortar and pestle to grind tablet to a refined powder. So for those which are film coated tablets, when you actually crush it, it may have this kind of eggshell appearance. So we'll be able to uh, soften the coating first and assuring that we'll be able to remove this eggshell appearance no? from a film a film coating you know, that are floating within a particular suspension. No? And if you have using capsules, then we'll be able to open the capsule first and empty the powder into the mortar and pestle and discard the particular capsule shell. And the solutions, we take note that solutions need to be clear, need to be homogeneous then versus the compounded suspension. So there are really differences then between suspension and of course, solutions. Now, these are the different sources of the formulary that we have. The Compedia example would be our British uh, Pharmacopeia, our Philippine Pharmacopeia, then our Martindale 28, the USP, National Formulary, and other uh, literatures. And hospital usually often have their own kind of formulary. So sometimes in a formulary in the Philippines, 
that it doesn't include it. So we'll be able to have um, you know, an advice from the FDA with regards to the certain types of uh, a particular uh, compounded medication that can be and can be um, needed then in terms of our hospital treatment in a primary uh, care. And some of the general practitioners, our physicians then may have their own formularies. So we'll be able to look into if it is really evidence-based, okay? So we'll be able to look at it and some of the published literatures or journals, articles, and evidence base. Often, usually, some of it are an American literature or a European literatures. I hope in the Philippines we will have uh, certain formularies then. I have seen the Philippine National Drug Formulary, and I've seen that it is only some essential drugs or essential medicines there. There may be some ingredients, but uh, mostly these are prepared. Okay, that needs a challenge then for our Philippine government, uh, for our Food and Drug Administration to put into our compounded medications. Okay, so these are some of the literatures then, uh, Chapter 795 uh, for pharmaceutical compounding non-sterile preparations, and for 797, which are your sterile preparations, and other chapters like Containers 661, Good Compounding Practice, Pharmaceutical Stability 1150, and Pharmaceutical Dosage Form, which are 1151. Okay? And when we actually formulate then, there may be some problems like cracking, caking, precipitation, especially when there are incompatibilities, no? especially with sterile preparation or non-sterile preparation. There might be problem in terms of chemical degradation. Usually, some of them are pH dependent, as mentioned a while ago. And some of it may be limits for active, usually uh, what to be the acceptance criteria of a particular particular drug, particular formulations then. And some of it may have uh, a, really a challenge then for uh, microbial preservative system. No? So some of it may be added up with uh, preservative. Some of the patient may have some problems in terms of, um, you know, uh, allergic reaction for preservatives. So these are some of the challenges that we have. And some of that in the shelf life for this microbial preservative system and close pack may be longer than open pack. So those open pack examples will be used 14 days after after uh, a certain opening of a certain drug, okay? So commonly requested dosage form, especially nine styra, uh, those which are usually dermatological for the skin, the creams, ointment, paste, lotion, thermal solution. Some of it will be in oral ingestion, especially have difficulty in swallowing, have a problem in terms of the oral uh, cavities, which are can be prescribed then uh, compounded then uh, in terms of suspension, solution, mucilage, traditionally may be elixir, mixture, linctus, no? and some of them are in an oral solution or suspension, unless otherwise uh, it may be given into another dosage form. Now, uh, these are less commonly uh, dosage form, which are non-sterile, which have also refer cigarette injectable capsule, powders, because some of our preparation already in the market in the Philippines, they may be in a form of a capsule and, of course, in a, in a tablet form. No? Some of them are maybe in a powder form, okay, which are usually in the Philippines, some of it yeah, are put into a certain powders. And uh, another kind of a less common dosage form are your bars of soap, lozenge, suppositories, which are not oftenly in the Philippines and other countries. Okay, So some of it will be an oral liquid. Uh, so if we actually formulate or compound a certain oral liquids, we may have this following question. One would be, is drug soluble in a vehicle at dosage required? Because may, there may be incompatibility. Some of it may, may be, um, you know, cannot be mixed to one another. Okay. Uh, and if not, could a suspension be prepared, a uh, crush tablet or use a powder, or uh, use a highest strength tablet to reduce overall excipient, 
or check if it is actually a controlled release so we don't rush a particular controlled release because it's already modified, it's already controlled, and if it's controlled then, is it sugar coated? Is it film coated that needs to be needs to actually remove its particular eggshell? Is it entire coated then? No? So and of course some of it may not going to be modified or not going to be crushed. So you need to really to identify which among need need not to be crushed and those which can be crushed. And of course, the good practice will always use the same brand and the strength of a drug, no? and the care in terms of our law, especially with Generics Act of 1988. No? So the bioavailability then needs to be considered in terms of a particular drug. No? So if, like for example, the bioavailability of a certain drug will not be suitable because it is deteriorated, especially when it mixed with water or it mixed with a particular solvent, then need to be considered. Okay, and the good practice that we need to standardize a particular dose, uh, especially if that to be um, in a particular uh, easy uh, measurement, such as 5 ml or 1 ml then, rather than if that to be 10.5, 1.5, no? So need to really to standardize it. And it may be dilute, uh, it may dilute injection fluids from a particular ampule. So take note if we are, uh, breaking with the ampules, there's maybe certain glass with it, so you need really to have, really need to extract a particular liquid without a certain glass. Okay, and of course, in making the suspension from a particular tablet, so you put the tablet into the mortar and pestle, you'll be able to grind. Make it sure that it is not a modified release, it is not a controlled release. And of course, as what we mentioned in our part two, particularly pediatrics, we will not mix it, especially with a par, uh, shall we say, fluid or a particular, uh, particular uh, milk or uh, a liquid form no, of, uh, that will be ingested uh, with a child. No? So it's a no-no because there may be incompatibilities then with the milk or a particular juice or a particular liquid. Now, these are the di different steps then that are vital then to give a very homogeneous product. Wet it first and, uh, of course, wetting it so that particular eggshell will actually be gone. Uh, at the same time, also need really to, uh, need to really to have crushing, grinding, wetting, and, of course, pasting to give a very homogeneous product. Now, moving on. We have the importance in terms of calculation skills that we need to really identify when we do a prescription analysis. So we need to have a full understanding of what is really required then to prevent a dispensing error. And we'll be able to ensure a correct clinical interpretation of a particular prescription. Uh, we'll be able to ask also, is it really overdose or underdose when we dilute it with a certain liquid then? And of course, uh, some dermatologists that really um, need your particular uh, advice then or a given you a particular prescription then. So you'll be able to actually translate it into a computer generated rather than uh, you know, a, a particular handwriting because sometimes it may be eligible in terms of handwriting that really actually hamper in terms of understanding with a particular prescription. So there might be misinterpretation then. No? and beware of a progressive misinterpretation of a particular prescription that will hamper in terms of our calculation. Now, moving on, beware of the complacency. We should not be assuming, we should not be so complacent of a particular prescription when we analyze we, the we all know policy and one plus one, we're in, uh, we'll be able to add up all, no? Uh, we need to be able to analyze no, and be able to compute in terms of percentage then. And check this every day as a pharmacist then. Usually errors happen, but then it's a silly mistake then to have an error. It's a no-no for all of us to actually commit with an error, especially calculation errors. We'll be able to establish rules and regulations. A guidelines then in terms of counting compounding medications then you need to have a standard operating procedure and even worksheets the proper documentation for your particular 
uh, prescriptions, especially compounded medications. In summary of uh, dealing with a prescription, we'll be able to often be lacking, uh, identify lacking details. Don't take as a face value where in the doctors would say that, oh, please do compound the previous medication I gave you. Uh, later on, I will give you the prescription. So you need to be able to be to uh, scrutinize really, not with the face value, but of course with the prescription. The usual clinical assessment has patient had medicine before, possibly from the hospital. Save details worksheet or a, a particular record then, so that you will have a guideline if it is. Uh, suitable then if there's no uh, if you be able to assess and evaluate if there's a compatibility uh, compatibility or incompatibilities of a particular prescription you'll be able to consider shelf life is a close and open you know, so depending on the uh, stability of a drug once it's closed or open a pack size and a storage condition of a particular compounded medication and we'll be able to use your scientific knowledge for a particular calculation or a particular clinical features of a particular compounded medications. And in summary of managing with your patient, you'll be able to collect and deliver an arrangement uh, for the patient. So they'll be able to collect, a how do you be able to collect the particular medication and the storage of a particular medicine and how you'll be able to deliver it. To the patient are they going to get it in your boutique are they going to get in your pharmacy or your clinic you know, by the nurse or by the by the patient and you'll be able to establish a good practice you know, and routine so with your practice for several months or years then you'll be able to have a good guideline a good standard then in terms of compounding with the medication. So meaning you learn basically on your experience no? and based on the guidelines that you have, the literatures that you have, so you'll be able to really form a good practice then and a good standard. And consider bank holidays because it may have, you know, if it is a holiday then, then of course the patient may actually go or may not go then depending on the working schedule of a particular patient then and the logistics and carrying with a particular drug, if it is, you know, uh, the patient will go to the supermarket then before going to their houses. So it takes really time for them to fridge or to have a storage for a particular drug. So you'll be able to consider it if they really go immediately to their houses no? because the stability would matters also with this. And the compliance then, so we need to simplify uh, this uh, this particular frequency for a particular uh, particular medication. So administering one ml will be easier than administering five ml for a particular patient, especially with neonates or a pediatric patient. Then, an accurate dosing then would result a good uh, you know a good result for your patient. At the same time, also proper counseling. And of course, counseling in terms of using with a syringe, using it for a particular device so that it will be easier for them to administer rather than using with household measure like your kuchala and of course your uh, tablespoon, no? teaspoon for that matter. And of course, accurate packaging for, uh, for a particular drug because sir, there are some drugs when it is actually unstable for like... Um, having sunlight in the houses, no uh, uh, proper storage in terms of putting it in the fridge, you know, that matters also with the packaging of a drug. No? So it really matters for this. At the same time, availability of the raw materials. So depending on the raw materials in your pharmacy, is it a pharmaceutical grade based on British pharmacopoeia in terms of uh, European pharmacopoeia or is it within the USP and F? No, uh, need to be obtained, especially for raw materials. And also, if what is that? Is it a laboratory grade? Is it a human grade then? Analytical grade then that are available? So you need really to talk to your uh, particular vendor or a particular um, you know, a manufacturer of your raw materials then, okay? or a distributor of the raw materials. And maybe using a licensed medicine, like for example, crushing tablets, diluting a particular steroid queen, such as Betvate, 
no? and difficulty to obtain a smaller quantity of a pure drug powder. So you need really to buy a bulk of it no? for you. So it's really very costly when you do a compound compounding, but uh, the return on investment is there also no? in your community pharmacy. But in the Philippine setting, we don't usually... Uh, we, we, it's quite rare no, in the Philippines to have this compounding uh, practice no, in the community pharmacy. But uh, I've seen a lot in the hospital setting, but not much in the, uh, not much in the, in the particular uh, community setting then. So need to consider also the transmissible spongiform encephalopathy then, uh, especially with lanolin, okay, there may be carrying of microbial contamination in a particular, uh, particular um, base or a particular uh, product then. So we need really to consider a septic technique when handling with a particular raw materials and a good practice to obtain a, certified of, a certificate of analysis. And may need to use another unlicensed medicine like imported tablets that need to be assuring its particular uh, quality and, of course, the safety of a particular uh, unlicensed medicine. Okay, so this is a, a particular workflow that may be adaptable here in the Philippines. This is according to the Ministry of in Malaysia. And uh, we can identify first the list of extemporaneously medicine currently being used in your particular community or in a hospital setting or in a clinic. And if yes, then we'll be able to check appropriateness of a certain medicine. If no, then we be, we're not going to proceed it. but if it's yes then we'll be able to check the registration status of a particular extemporaneously compounded medication if it's no then get the company or manufacturer to register or produce for you and then if it's yes then you'll be able to determine in a particular status in the ministry or in a particular department of health or FDA if it is uh, if you are licensed then or if you have an authority to compound a certain medication and you'll be able to actually determine if the manufacturer can actually can uh, there's a label there if it can be compounded or not or it can be extemporaneously compounded or not that particular medication now if it is yes then you'll be able to check commercially available but if it's no then apply to get into your a particular ministry or a particular de uh, department of health then in a in a particular country then if it is uh, yes then you'll be able to check if it is commercially available if no, then you prepare and dispense a particular extemporaneously compounded medication. But if it is yes, check the cost of a certain commercial product versus the cost of a preparer because sometimes it's, it's more expensive you know, to compound a certain medication because you, you need to have a bulk cost of it. Now, um, of course, it depends upon the cost, the availability then you know, in the market. And uh, if it is, you'll be able to prepare and dispense extemporaneously compounded medication. Uh, if it is not in the commercial uh, market, but if it is yes, then check the cost. After checking the cost, then you propose a hospital to purchase you know, uh, for the raw materials and, of course, uh, for a particular uh, product you know, or medicine. Then there's a label for extemporaneously compounded preparation. There are different details of it. Uh, details of the community, the hospital, the expiration date, the drug name with the strength, the details of the patient, administration and age, special instruction. If there's need to be a refill or precautions then, or keep up the reach of children then, so you'll be able to identify. At the same time, for the compounder or pharmacist name, should be there in the label of an extemporaneously uh, prepared medication. Now, in the worksheet, uh, this is the, the particular um, uh, particular compounding um, particular compounding mechanism that you have. Uh, here, you, you can actually identify also the following details. We have the patient's name, ID number, prescription number, date of the prescription, the name of the drug, the dose, the volume of the diluent or the vehicle then, the batch number of, 
preparations and starting materials, the name and the signature of the preparing personnel, the name and signature of a checking personnel. So uh, in this worksheet, it's not you that that actually prepare with this medication that that matters on its particular uh, safety and effectiveness of a particular medication, but need to have other person then to check with your uh, prepared medication so that there will be counterbalance or a counter checking for your prepared medication. Now, uh, this really in terms of checking with your prescription uh, for extemporaneously compounded preparations in, the, in your particular pharmacy. Uh, after receiving the prescription, you'll be able to check the availability of the medicine. After checking, then you'll be able to discuss if really it needs to have an extemporaneously or not, or if or alternate uh, medicine then for a particular extemporaneously compounded medication. Now you'll be able to check commercially if if uh, there is available in the market or in a retail pharmacy. Then you'll be able to search for an evidence base if. If you want to prepare an extemporaneously compounded medication and you'll be able to instruct the patient, the caregiver on how to use uh, and pre uh, prepare prior to the administration of the medicine. It's either that you need really to uh, reconstitute it or really need to actually um, shake well before using it you know, and how to really uh, like, for example, if you prepared an extemporaneously compounded suppository, how the, pa how the caregiver or the patient actually insert it to the pedia or uh, to themselves, okay? So that is really uh, matters also in terms of our counseling. And you'll be able to dispense the medicine and counsel the patient or caregiver uh, accordingly. So uh, with this before dispensing, you, there will always be uh, labeling of it, the correct label, the correct instruction to our client before dispensing the particular medication and counseling the particular uh, patient or caregiver accordingly. So one of the examples then of a particular drug is uh, that is extemporaneously compounded. Uh, it, this is an example in Malaysia that I get is an allopurinol suspension 20 milligram per ml. So this is actually an indicator for a gout or have an increase in uric acid and calcium oxalate in the renal stones. And this is actually prepared in a suspension, 20 milligram per, uh, per ml. And the stability of this drug according to the literature is 60 days. And this must be stored in a refrigerator, preferably. Uh, uh, and also it can be stored in a room temperature. Uh, these are the ingredients that you can have and how the vehicle, the vehicle can be in this particular uh, formulation, can be in a cherry syrup or a blend SF. Uh, and of course, uh, equivalence vehicle or a sweet or a metal cellulose 1% or a simple syrup, okay? That will be added up to allopurinol 30, 300 milligram or eight tablets. Then this is the procedure. You're gonna crush in a mortar and pestle, to a fine powder and levigate uh, the powder with a small amount of a vehicle so that may smooth paste is actually formed and add more vehicle to the paste until the liquid is formed and transfer the liquid into the container and use the additional vehicle to rinse the remaining drug from the mortar and pour into the container. Make up to the final volume with the vehicle, shake well, and of course, label. So you'll be able to have the note. Why note? Because you'll be able to actually counsel the patient in terms of how to actually uh, some of the instructions. Uh, then this particular drug, especially with uh, cherry syrup, then for pediatric, you know, for a particular patient, no, not with a pediatric. Pediatric. I'm sure there's no gout with a pediatric patient or, or a increase of a uric acid, but for adult or a geriatric patient for this, no? for this particular uh, particular drug. We have also alprazolam suspension, one milligram per uh, five uh, for, per ml. Then as what we mentioned a while ago with allopurinol then, uh, maybe the patient had difficulty in terms of swallowing with the medication. So we may be able to have it in a suspension. Take note if uh, the patient is diabetic, then have all of the sweets. 
may actually have this uh, interference. No? And of course, alprazolam suspension is for anxiety disorder that we uh, converted then into a suspension from alprazolam one milligram into uh, for anxiety disorder, it can be converted then to a particular suspension then, okay? 60 days uh, and then the room temperature uh, and then protect from light, okay? So the vehicle choice would be x step or a suspension system. So the procedure of this would be in the following, crush the tablet in a mortar and pestle, navigate the powder with a small amount of vehicle until smooth paste will form, Add more vehicle to the paste until the liquid is formed and transfer the liquid into the container. Use the vehicle, uh, add additional vehicle to rinse the remaining drug from the mortar and pour into the container and make up to the final volume with the vehicle and shake well and of course label. Another drug would be amlodipine suspension, one milligram per ml. So as we can see here, this is for hypertension and converted into a suspension. Especially with geriatric patients have difficulty in terms of swallowing, we may convert it into a suspension then. So this is particular strength, the quantity, the procedure then, and of course, the particular vehicle of choice. Okay? So we're preparing in terms of cross-contamination. So the words would be mixing up with the product label with another product or else it may have cross-contamination therefore microbes, especially with bacteria or fungi. Does the product have a preservative system? That's basically the question then. No? And of course, uh, the physical, maybe it may have a dust in your area or a particular plastic then or a glass in a particular ampule. Okay, or it may be in a chemical residues or particles of another drug. And uh, the basic approach to risk analysis then, we'll be able to picture out the worst scenario. What to be the possibility in terms of errors then? And what to be the consequences then to a particular patient? And how likely or the frequency is this type of error to a particular patient? And would the checking pharmacies or the patient will be able to identify and detect a particular error. So this needs to be uh, done then in terms of risk analysis. Now, need to develop a best practice then, simplify, uh, simplify counseling to your patients, simplify simply simple but effective methods on the batch seed sheets. we be able to simplify your, your batch seed sheets then and standard operating procedures should be done in your compounding area. Perform a risk assessment, as what I mentioned a while ago, in terms of risk analysis. In-house risk mitigation technique to prevent such error. Example, empty blister strips applied to release masses. Then, uh, in terms of the risk of any incompatibilities of the prescription no, and others. So, this would be your critical to read the, the case known as the peppermint water case and answer the following. So how is the case related to the compounding error? Interventions then needed before and after compounding medications. And that's all for today. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Erwin martinez Valier, your professor in pharmacy, pharmacy department and also the visiting professor in Bournemouth University, United Kingdom. Thank you very much. I hope you learned a lot for today.